On behalf of my colleagues here at the University of Toledo College of Medicine and Life Sciences, I'd like to welcome you to the virtual GME open house this evening. Uh, one of our colleagues, Dr. Rob Frederick, will be joining us shortly, but in the interim, uh, we thought we'd like to get started. And again, welcome to all of our guests who are here with us. We're very excited to have you, and we're really looking forward to you learning more about uh, our College of Medicine and our GME programs, and a little bit more about the University of Toledo in general. My name is uh, Dr. Jim Kloshinsky. I've been at the university for 22 years, and I'm a professor of medicine, and I'm also the senior associate dean for the affiliation with Prometica. And so I've had a number of roles at the university, both as a practicing internist and then on the administrative side of the College of Medicine. I've been the associate dean for admissions, the associate dean for graduate medical education in the DIO, and then most recently took on the role of senior associate dean for the affiliation. So again, very excited to have you and let's get started. And I'm Dr. Rob Frederick. It's a pleasure for us and an honor to have you join us in the midst of um, tremendous activities in your life where you're busier than can be, and we appreciate it. Yeah, so just to give a quick overview of the objectives, basically we want to just provide a quick overview of our GME programming and the university itself and the community we live in for our residents and our fellows in our programs. Um, we also want to make sure we discuss well um, and spend a good bit of our time discussing our approach to diversity, inclusion, and creating a supportive environment for the University of Toledo College of Medicine GME programs and its learners uh, and the entire community. Um, and then finally, a good bit of our time, we hope to have you enjoy the experience of listening and hearing and discussing via chat um, the experiences from current UT residents. And that's probably the, one of the biggest events that we have found is helpful to students in getting a good understanding of what life is like as a resident in our programs. So it's just the agenda tonight. Um, welcome an overview, um, which we're doing at this moment. We're also going on to discuss the College of Medicine, the university, and our GME programming, as well as um, our affiliation between the University of Toledo College of Medicine and ProMedica, uh, the local regional healthcare system that's uh, strongly affiliated with the university. And then, of course, as I mentioned, diversity, inclusion, and well-being, especially our approach to GME and the university's strategic plan around those elements. And then finally, wrap up with the panel discussion with our residents, Q&A, and closure. Just a little bit about the university to understand who we are and, why, and what the supporting organization behind our graduate education is all about. The university was established in 1872. We have about 270 or a few more total programs that are offered, whether it's undergraduate, graduate, or professional programming. Um, and we have over 18,000 students between the two major areas of campuses, as well as 55 million in research, which is a fair bit um, that we really relish in the College of Medicine and how it impacts our learning. And then we have two major campuses, uh, primary campuses, the main campus, and then the University of Toledo College of Medicine campus or Health Sciences campus, and then some other smaller campuses. And then the College of Medicine. So this was founded originally uh, named the Medical College of Ohio at Toledo in 1964. Um, we currently have 700 medical students. We have another couple of hundred students in other uh, health related programming on the campus. And we have about 1600 faculty members and then the graduate education, which is specifically what we want to hone in a little bit on 350 plus residents and fellows. Uh, we have 16 uh, fellowships and 14 core program residency programs that are accredited by ACGME. We also have some other programs that are accredited by, for example, dentistry, as well as a few other uh, accrediting bodies as well. So this is just a quick list. Um, and all of these things that I'm talking about now, I should have said earlier, are in much better and depth on our website. So these are our 14 residency programs and 16 fellowships. So a little bit about our primary teaching sites, like where are our residents and fellows getting the majority of their training? So the, um, the majority of training is in a transition uh, over the past five years 
from the uh, University of uh, Toledo Medical Center campus in a large number of programs, but not all, and not all training. Uh, so the largest volume of training, the number of programs that spend the majority of their time at the um, Toledo Hospital Toledo Children's Campus is, in, is increasing. And there's just a picture of that. So just a few highlights about that campus. So it's a tertiary center, uh, 850 or a little more beds. In 2019, it was expanded with another 13 story tower. The uh, hospital itself has a little more than 37,000 admissions, around 90 to 100,000 ER visits. And you get the picture, it's a higher acuity hospital in many respects with advanced uh, treatment and trauma, STEMI or cardiac, obstetrics, pediatrics, and other areas, including stroke. Um, Recent recognition are a number of those areas uh, with regard to its tertiary services, and it serves a large swath of the geography of Northwest Ohio and Southeast Michigan. The University of Toledo Medical Center is the established longstanding academic research based institution that our programs uh, in many respects have had as its home and also continue to have a continued activity on the campus. It is a smaller hospital. It serves as a, a large teaching footprint, and as well as it's associated with the campus connected to research <clears throat> enterprise of the university, as well as the multidisciplinary programs in areas such as pharmacy um, and uh, allied health, as well as nursing. So in those respects, that's the, uh, the historic academic center. It is a, a serving in two primary roles, a community hospital for the southwest portion of the city of Toledo and the surrounding community in that area, as well as specialty care in a number and variety of areas that are uh, unique. For example, transplant services, advanced geriatrics, and a large degree of behavioral health and other areas. So the, our learners have these two primary centers as the hubs for their training, and it gives a good mix of exposure for our residents and fellows. We do have a lot of other sites that are used. Those are just examples of the primary areas. For more details on the other sites, we'd ask that you just look at our website for each of our programs. They have a pretty good listing of the other sites that are used. And then um, one of our other points of training that is uh, tremendous for all of our programs, as well as student learners, is our uh, Immersive uh, Interprofessional Simulation Center. It's uh, very modern, contemporary in its recent construction, uh, very well equipped, three floors of different levels of activities or types of activities within the center. Um, highlights for residency and fellowship training, surgical and other procedural skill labs, um, a robotic simulation program that is second to none, uh, patient interview and evaluation center, which many students are very commonly familiar with. And then there's a big association in the ISCI with uh, biomedical research and innovation. And so that's partnering with other colleges in the university, uh, such as uh, engineering, mathematics, and uh, natural science, as well as the business development and innovations program. So that's our simulation center that we're extremely proud of. So we would be remiss if we didn't talk about our community. So um, Toledo, and this, this shot here is uh, just, a, uh, just a view of the downtown area, which is robust, growing, and uh, one of the named Renaissance city centers uh, in our state and uh, maybe nationally. Um, so just a few details. Um, we could talk about our community for the entire length of our session tonight, which would not be obviously fair. but. Um, so some of the highlights is it's a uh, obviously a mid-sized community, but uh, it's welcoming and inclusive uh, in its environment. It's a mid-sized city with attractions of a larger market. Um, we have much to offer. It's a great place to do graduate education training for many of us to establish our careers here. Um, but on the off chance that more is needed or more is desired, um, there are additional opportunities that are reasonably drive. So a reasonable drive away that occasionally residents and uh, fellows do take advantage of Detroit, Cleveland, Chicago, Cleveland areas as examples. Thank you, Dr. Frederick. I had mentioned at the beginning that I had taken on a role of Senior Associate Dean for uh, Clinical Affiliation at Prometica. I just wanted to spend a minute or two to kind of highlight what that is and kind of what that means for you as a, as a graduate medical education learner. So the College of Medicine 
uh, as Dr. Frederick indicated, is pretty big. Our medical school class is about 700. Our residents and fellows are about 350. So we had over 1,000 learners. Uh, primarily at the University of Toledo Medical Center as our main teaching hospital and, and other sites as well. But we appreciated and realized that we really needed a larger clinical footprint to be able to grow and expand programs and uh, to really have a good, uh, robust clinical experience for our learners. Most of your top medical schools in the country are associated with healthcare systems. If you would look at the top 50 or 100, rated uh, uh, hospitals in the country, really all of them are part of or associated with academic medicine. So in Toledo, Prometica really served as a perfect partner for us. We signed a 50 year binding agreement in 2015. Uh, it's not short term, it's intended to be long term and committed with over a $2.5 billion investment. Um, there were uh, several guiding principles of the affiliation but a couple that I listed here was to develop the Toledo Hospital and the Ebi Children's Hospital into a premier academic medical center and to support programs that enhanced our education and research for our uh, learners, our students, residents, and fellows. And importantly, this is a venue for us to attract not only top talent with respect to faculty, but also to help retain students into residency and residents into practice or fellowship, and then those fellows, of course, eventually joining uh, in Northwest Ohio too. It was really intended to be a pipeline for that, and that's what one of our goals is. I won't go into more detail about the GME programming, but I would refer you to our GME homepage and our website. This will give you an opportunity really to look at each program individually, uh, to be able to reach out to specific contacts for programs you're interested in. So please access that website if you have any questions and our uh, residency coordinators or program directors would be happy to email or speak with you about our offerings. The last thing I wanted to mention was relative to the university and the College of Medicine's commitment to diversity, inclusion, and well-being. You know, I think for us, it all starts with leadership. And I wanna highlight uh, both the university strategic plan as well as the College of Medicine strategic plan that were both revamped uh, this past academic year. So from the university perspective, we had a three-year uh, strategic plan. And then on, from the College of Medicine side, we also initiated a strategic plan, which we had not had before. And diversity and inclusion is a key part of that. One of the things that is important, at least to me, is plans are really critical. And I think when you're looking at a GME program, you want to look at what are the leadership goals and how are they articulated in a plan. But really what I found most effective is both the plan and people. Without people to implement that plan, to me, that's where your, your valuable capital is. And I'm very lucky to serve with outstanding colleagues, two of whom I'm going to introduce right now. One is Dr. Kimberly Jenkins, who is an associate professor in anesthesia, as well as the associate dean for diversity and inclusion. And my other colleague is uh, Dr. Shaza Afimani, who is the assistant dean for graduate medical education and an assistant professor in emergency medicine. And so I'm lucky every day to be able to work with uh, leaders like this who help implement those university and college of medicine uh, strategic plans. One of the things that I wanted to, to mention too in brief is I've had the opportunity this year to get involved in mentorship at the student level. And I think Dr. Jenkins will elaborate on this later, but one of the things relative to students, faculty and staff is I've had the opportunity to mentor both in the learning communities that have been set up through our curriculum as well as some formal mentorship programs for those students that are underrepresented in medicine to be able to establish those early relationships when they come into medical school and to carry that relationship throughout the four years of medical school, really as a guidepost and someone that the students can connect with and bond to as they go through the trials of tribulations of medical school and eventually get ready for match and entering into GME. 
without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to Dr. Jenkins and Dr. Athamani. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for your kind words. It's my pleasure to serve alongside the leadership with you as well. Um, I'm Kim Jenkins, Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion and also a Associate Professor for Anesthesia. So I'll try not to put you to sleep tonight. I know you probably had a late night last night. Um, one of the things I'm really proud about tonight is, is, is the timing because unprecedented times. Uh, these are uncertain times. And uh, I think when we were planning this open house, some uh, kind of, you know, told us, well, maybe you'd like things to kind of settle down before you have an open house um, related to diversity and inclusion and supporting underrepresented minority uh, applicants. Um, but on the contrary, the leadership here and, you know, that we embrace the opportunity to to showcase how we can be supportive of you. Uh, in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of crisis, in the midst of, of storms, so that you know um, that that we will provide uh, the guidance uh, and encourage for uh, meant for you as you're pursuing your your goals. One of the things that we have uh, are really proud about is our three years certificate for diversity and inclusion, and. It is really the culmination of efforts from students, uh, residents, faculty, and staff. Uh, that started about a year ago, and um, the real mission there is is promoting equity, diversity, and inclusion throughout the College of Medicine. Uh, and and I want to give a few highlights uh, of this plan. And um, and and and. Part of the foundation is uh, recruitment and retention, education, training, inclusion in terms of promoting an inclusive environment, community outreach, and uh, communication. And, and our aim really is that, um, you, that you feel welcome. I mean, that's when we think about a culture of inclusion, it's that understanding that you feel welcome, um, that you feel uh, welcome, that you see um, in the leadership uh, that you belong, that you see in the education and training opportunities that that you belong, and and some of our affinity groups, including SNMA, give opportunities to get involved uh, in the community in mentorship. There are several community outreach initiatives. Um, SNMA has been around for several years, um, but we also have new organizations, including um, White Coats for Black Lives. And this is a newly developed uh, organization um, with over 300 members. When I say new, just in the last couple months, this is an organization uh, developed with students, faculty, and resident support. Um, to with the underlying mission of facing and addressing and dismantling racism in medicine and promoting wellness for uh, people of color. And there are also opportunities to work outside of these four walls of the institution. So when we talk about promoting a culture of inclusion, we, we don't want to just feel kind of satisfied with what we're doing uh, for each other as members of the College of Medicine, but how we are connecting and building and bridging relationships with the patient population that we're privileged to serve. So one of those uh, initiatives is the Barbershop Initiative, uh, which was started in 2017 as part of the ProMedica Men's Health and Wellness Program. And um, students are involved, residents are involved, healthcare providers, uh, nursing and, and physicians are involved in um, uh, sessions in the barber shops with, in collaboration with uh, barbers and patrons of those shops to uh, really promote uh, health screening, health education, and opportunities to engage with uh, resources. Um, and, and a new arm of that will be the salon initiative to kind of address uh, health care disparities in Af African American uh, communities and women and men. And there are other opportunities um, to, to serve. Um, when we first uh, looked at this three year plan, uh, we want to kind of look at where we're at so we can know where we're uh, headed. And, and one of the opportunities to serve is in. Uh, leadership role in the Dean's Advisory Council. 
Um, and this would be a way to uh, have direct input into some of our programs, initiatives, and policies that kind of form the framework for our, our mission within the college. Um, and, and, and this is an opportunity for us to connect outside of our, um, uh, our, our clinical um, duties, um, but to have kind of a lasting impact is as a resident, you could have a lasting impact into uh, some of our directives for years to come. One of the, the, the real primary objectives when you're thinking about promoting a culture of inclusion is to have regular input and conversation. So we've had um, monthly dialogues on diversity, um, monthly roundtable discussions, uh, town halls, um, which have really created spaces for students and, and faculty and residents to engage across uh, difficult uh, terrain. We've had uh, town halls on confronting uh, racial injustices during the pandemic. And we've also had, um, in, and this really engaged um, our legal experts, our you know, educators in the Toledo public school systems, our, our physicians, students, you know, just having a way for us to really bridge um, connections uh, and meaningful discussions and crucial conversations. Uh, we've had this uh, town hall on social injustices amidst the pandemic. We've had um, uh, other town halls, including um, talks on race, racism, equity, and inclusion. And, um, you know, just these, and, and Dr. Kleczynski was on that call several months ago. Um, you know, one thing I'm really proud of when we have these roundtable and, and town hall discussions is that we tend to kind of want to run away from the fires a lot of times when we have discussions. And I'm, I'm very proud of the way that we have engaged moving into the burning building and really confronting some of these difficult conversations amongst uh, ourselves. Students have been able to, for example, in a town hall like this, have direct engagement with the leadership and residents, direct engagement with the leadership so that we can, you know, really have uh, uh, meaningful discussions that can uh, help us in meeting uh, the patient population we serve. And we've also hosted quarterly women in medicine town halls, uh, and, and these really address issues on um, self-advocacy, mentorship, uh, finding that elusive work-life balance, um, and, and then really, again, confronting issues and combating issues surrounding sex sexism and racism. You know, these are um, ongoing uh, opportunities for students, residents, and faculty to engage outside of the clinical setting. And then through our Language of Diversity uh, series, we have monthly speakers who speak not only to the members within the College of Medicine, but we open this up to the community so that, you know, uh, for example, uh, here, Dr. De Silva spoke uh, to our students and residents, but we also open this up to, you know, high school students and their parents who could come in and get some insight into some of the challenges that he's faced and overcome throughout his career. And, and one thing I'm really proud of that's been around for over 15 years are some of our pipeline programs. And in, in many respects, when you think about underrepresented groups, uh, it's very common to feel overwhelmed, to feel isolated, to feel alone. Uh, and in many ways, the best way to, to find yourself is, is to lose yourself in serving others. So mentoring opportunities abound throughout the college. There's Toledo STARS uh, program, which is a uh, year-long program in partnership with Toledo Public Schools and Upward Bound, um, and it gives you an opportunity to have regular engagement with students who are underrepresented minorities, um, social economically disadvantaged, living below the poverty line, um, and those who will be first-generation uh, college students. So um, these are opportunities to mentor throughout the year. And we also have, um, and, and these are opportunities for um, our students uh, to shadow. And then we also have the REACH program, which is our, our summer program 
which we have had virtually over this over the last uh, few months. Uh, and this is um, an opportunity to have a daily encounter where the students are obviously out of school and can have that daily encounter with our uh, the members of the college giving insight into uh, time management, setting goals, how to apply for college. These things that a lot of times at this point in your career as medical students, you may uh, have kind of taken for granted, but these are this is like a lifeline to students who have no one in the household who's gone to college, for example. This is an example of uh, Janelle Edwards, who's a PhD uh, sen candidate uh, senior was in the REACH program several years ago, and now she's serving as a mentor for uh, some of our students with greatest needs. So uh, in many ways, is a, a success story. But again, these are opportunities for you when you're feeling um, you know, that, that classic imposter syndrome to connect with students who have uh, great needs. The underserved uh, populations are even more underserved in a pandemic. The marginalized are even more part marginalized. So um, those disparities, uh, you know, have a, a wider gap uh, during these times. And this is an opportunity uh, for you to serve. And, and again, this is part of, uh, of our strategic plan. When we think about recruitment and retention of women and underrepresented uh, faculty residents and staff. Um, we, we are looking at ways to meet those needs. Open houses are opportunities for you to see uh, not just what, um, you know, kind of show what you have to offer, but to see what a residency program has to offer you. How does this uh, destination for your training, your residency training meet your needs? And so we, I think one of the, the, the biggest uh, things that any residency can program program can offer for underrepresented groups is to show that your value, uh, that you will have value, that your worth is affirmed, that we um, will uh, have a welcoming and inclusive culture once you arrive. And, and part of that is uh, in formulating recruitment plans and strategies um, with the specific goals over the next three years to attract faculty and residents to our program, to enhance mentoring opportunities um, to uh, to um, promote uh, and support attendance to conferences uh, and just to provide that continual uh, support of our learners as they want to participate in affinity groups, for example, and serve outside of the walls of this institution. And, and finally, uh, one of our, our biggest goals is in really improving our uh, diversity and inclusion education. We've uh, recently formulated the uh, Health Equity Curriculum Task Force uh, that has uh, faculty involvement. And this is uh, an ambitious goal to have an enhanced development of our core curriculum on diversity and inclusion and equity uh, issues. Um, and to really find a way um, to incorporate uh, in, a, in a longitudinal way um, some of these uh, goals throughout your education and training. And in a lot of ways, the way you start a thing is the, is the way you end it. So when we th even think about orientation, we want to make sure that we implement uh, some of these goals and these strategies in your training early on. So in, in the orientation, we really want to uh, ensure that we have uh, the face of, of, of diversity and, and inclusion goals uh, from the beginning so that you feel uh, included uh, from day one. And again, we, we help to support uh, service learning and community-based learning uh, outside of, of the formal setting. Uh, when you're thinking about where you want to go, I, I really want to encourage you to, to think about a place um, where you don't feel like you're a guest in the house, but where you feel like this is your house. And in many respects, having uh, the leadership here tonight, I hope really communicates to you that you will feel fully supported uh, and that you will feel uh, fully welcome uh, in, in a place uh, such as this. So without further ado, I want to 
pass the mic to Dr. Shaza as we talk about wellness. I always say you can't give what you don't have. So you want to make sure that your wellness cup is full uh, throughout every step of your journey. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins, and thank you, Dr. Klinchinski, for introducing me. Um, I'm Dr. Uthmani. I'm the Assistant Dean for Graduate Medical Education. Um, I'm actually very excited to be here today. I was actually an emergency medicine resident here a few years back and then became a faculty member and then associate program director. So, and now the assistant dean for graduate medical education. And one of my major roles here is actually well being and providing resources to residents and fellows. We have 354 residents and fellows here. And um, one of the major, I'm not gonna be able to go over everything, but I wanna go over the major highlights that we provide the residents and fellows. And one of them is Impact Solutions. This is a resident fellow assistance program. You can call them or text them. Um, it's a free 24 seven confidential support for all our residents and fellows, all of their dependents, um, anybody that lives in their household. And they are able to provide um, medical, uh, legal and um, uh, finance resources, which is obviously very important sometimes when, you know, after your loans and you kind of need a little bit of um, support, um, they're able to provide those type of resources. Um, and then coming in 2021, we are actually going to be able to provide um, a, a personal assistant that will be able to help with um, kind of like different um, you know, best options and services for like entertainment, dining, travel, tur tourism, um, things of that nature. And also they're going to be able to provide um, a life coach. You know, that is something that a resident or a fellow needs. Um, so we're, we're really excited to start, uh, start that in 2021. Um, and another huge thing that we actually um, started this year is a well-being champions. So back in March, right before COVID hit, um, we sent out a survey to all the residents and fellows to kind of get a little bit of ideas of what they're looking for and well-being and what type of structure they wanted. So um, the feedback that we got was uh, concierge service, um, programs that offer well-being events, and an institutional well-being events. So um, in July of 2020, just a few months ago, we started uh, we have residents, um, about one to three residents in every single program. Um, they form a well wellness committee and they meet me, meet with me once a month and we discuss and collaborate on different ideas and suggestions. And um, one thing that we came up with was um, for the concierge service was we were able to um, get Goodyear uh, car service here in town um, they are able to provide a service um, when you're on shift, they are able to um, uh, pick up your car from work, service the car and bring it back. Um, and the other thing that we are able to provide is a mail service. Um, you know, if you need to drop off your letters since you're working 60, 70 hours a week, um, we are able to provide a, there's a um, mail service down at, at the basement at both hospitals that you're able to drop off your letters. And the third thing that we are um, hoping to start in 2021 is a laundry service where they can come up, come to the hospital, um, pick up um, your laundry, service it, and bring it right back to you. Um, that way you don't have to do it on your days off. Um, um, and so we think it's very important. That's what the residents and fellows had asked for. Um, we are able to get uh, also um, uh, when we had talked to the residents, they wanted program well-being events, and those are uh, things that the uh, residents and fellows actually plan with the program directors, and they implement it throughout the year, whether it's going to be, you know, kayaking or a different type of bonding experiences throughout the year. Um, you know, those are things that each program is different and what they, what they want. And um, Rocket Wellness is the institutional well-being events they provide um, across the entire um, campuses on main campus and health science campus. And uh, they're able to provide different types of wellness events throughout the year. And this year, a lot of them are virtual, but they're able to um, give that to our residents and fellows. 
and um, even though it's uh, COVID, but uh, you are able to use your badge to get into any um, UT game as well. So um, there are two things that I do want to talk about today. One of them is patient safety. So patient safety is uh, we have two confidential. Um, uh, one is patient safety net and the other at UTMC and RL6 at ProMedica where you can report any near misses, medication events, medical errors, medical errors and they're all confidential. Um, and the last thing, but of course not least, is uh, we have a professional professionalism concern line, discrimination and sexual harassment. Um, you're obviously this is um, it could be confidential, um, and the university has a zero tolerance for any type of um, discrimination or sexual misconduct um, uh, against any members of the university. So I do have the link to our. Um, GME uh, wellness website. Um, I uh, encourage everyone to uh, log in and and look at it. Um, we do have a lot of um, areas that you can that we provide, and I uh, hope that I encourage you to um, have a look at it. I do want to um, uh, have the resident panel um, introduce themselves, and I'm going to kick it off to them. Hey, how's it going? I'm uh, I'm Eric Mandrano. I'm one of the uh, PGY ones in the emergency medicine program. So I uh, just wanted to introduce myself. Thank you. My name is Devin Francion. I'm a CA one, uh, which means I'm a second year anesthesia resident. Um, I trained in WV uh, like WVU WVSOM um, between the two. Uh, happy to answer any and all questions that you guys have. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Joanne Gikande. I'm actually a graduate of University of Toledo College of Medicine, and I'm currently a second year internal medicine resident. So I'm so glad you took the time to participate in this unique experience. Um, so any questions you have for us, we're very happy to answer. Hi everybody, I'm Jonathan Parra, first year EM resident as well uh, with Eric. Um, I'm happy answer any questions and I'm glad that you guys came to learn more about uh, our great program. Hi, I'm Latoya. I'm one of uh, I'm Latoya Jean-Pierre. I'm one of the uh, PGY1 uh, pediatrics residents. I'm also very excited to be here and answer any questions that anyone has. Uh, hi, hi, Dr. Sheza. How are you? Dr. Osmani, Dr. Jenkins. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to introduce myself and to meet you and to finally see your face. Uh, I'm Dalal al um a PGY-1 uh, pediatric resident, and I will be very happy answering and uh, any questions, introducing myself and uh, anything. For the first question, um, so I'm going to send this uh, first to Eric um, and Jonathan. Um, so can you guys tell us a little bit about well-being events that you participated here in, in residency? Yeah, so the last one we went to was a corn maze. That was quite fun. We got to, uh, there was like goats there. We got to go through a whole maze with the residents. And uh, they had tons of, you know, your typical Halloween foods, the like uh, your donuts, cider donuts, and cider. So that was a great event. Yeah, no, for the, uh, the wellness events that we had for emergency medicine, uh, one really big one that really stood out for us was the, um, uh, we had a wellness day where we had this, uh, I guess it was like this field day that we had, where we had these like competitions, but uh, what I really enjoyed about it was they paired us up between a uh, first year, second year, and third year. And the best part about that was just kind of working together, like trying to compete and get like first place. So uh, that was a good wellness event because, you know, we're, we're stressed out from working and, you know, just from the daily stuff. So. It was nice to uh, to get a break and uh, kind of do something physical. Joan and, and Devin, can, can you tell me a little bit about your experience here as a resident and, and ways that you have felt supported and, and any challenges that you had as well? That's a three part question. I know. Joan. <laughs> Joan, you can go first if you want. Joan, I'll go. Okay. Sure, Devin, thanks. So um, this is my second year. So thankfully I have made it through my intern year and that can be really, really challenging. One of the challenges is um, just trying to see where I can fit in with um, different personalities and different 
cultures. And what I like is that I didn't have to worry about that. I chose this program mainly knowing from my from attending as a student that you don't have to worry about um, where you fit in because you can see the support. Um, everyone is so it's, it's just visible and palpable. Um, one of the things I really like is the diversity of the program and the fact that you really don't have to mute yourself. You don't have to feel afraid to have questions and concerns. There's always someone who has your back, someone who's there to encourage you, someone who's there to support you. So, and you don't get, get that with a lot of places. Sometimes you kind of have to hide and step aside and just do the work. But when you don't have that, that to worry about, you can really um, develop and shine and embrace the people around you and really find your passion and have the people there who can support you. So even though last year for me was really stressful, I had time to hang out with people. I had time to bounce ideas with my colleagues, with, with attendings, with students. I felt like it was more of like a family oriented um, upbringing more so than one of the hardest years of residency. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was still difficult. There were a lot of long days, a lot, a lot of long hours, but um, it was there were there were mainly a lot of highs for me, so to speak. So that's what I like about being here in Toledo that you don't feel alone. You have a lot of support and they're um, there to support you throughout every step of the way. Thanks, Joan. Well said. And, and Devin, you want to chime in? Oh, yeah. So I'll go off on a little bit of a tangent and say that residency is going to be the best and worst years of your life. Um, you're going to have ups and downs. You're going to kind of be introduced to something that is completely different than, you know, what you have experienced thus far uh, in terms of t needing to uh, utilize your time management and whatnot. I found that the residency program itself does offer um, a whole bunch of different ways to uh, deal uh, with things that are coming up in your life, um, provide you with coping skills. They talked about impact solutions. I feel like I probably should have taken advantage of it a little bit more last year. I plan to this year. They offer a whole bunch of um, whole bunch of different opportunities, whether it's financial, uh, if you're looking to buy a house or a car or anything of that um, nature. Um, counseling, if you're in a relationship or if you just want it for yourself, I kind of signed up and I was about to go to the first session just for, I, I figured I'd do some couples counseling um, because I was going to get married and why not, you know, start to talk about coping strategies through hard times and, you know, how to, um, you know, better you and your partner and your relationship while you guys are in your formative years. Um, I think in my program itself, we've had wellness events, like uh, they brought uh, massage therapists to the department. We've gone out to a uh, Mexican restaurant and uh, out go-karting and uh, other fun events like that. We did a lot of um, work with the internal medicine guys for our first year, and we went to the same like mud hens game, uh, game or games. Uh, so they do do a lot to provide you with opportunities to de-stress. Um, and I think me and Joan worked a decent amount uh, together, you know, I think you do get the interaction with everybody and, and realize that everybody has your back. Thank you, Devin. Thank you, Devin. You're going to make people want to go into anesthesia for this. <laughs> <Take the massage. laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> massage day is coming around again. So. <laughs> All right. So anyone else want to want to chime in on, um, you know, just ways you felt supported or some of the challenges you've had? Uh, I definitely felt uh, supported. I totally agree with Joan. Intern, I'm an intern, and intern year is crazy. Um, you are learning so much, and you're adjusting so much, and you are kind of getting used to like the new level of responsibility, but also like the privilege to have uh, people trust in you. And I had an instant um, 
an, an event occur on the floor where it was like a very challenging and a very challenging patient case. And I was uh, like, after the event, I had my attendings come and talk to me and they were kind of telling me how much they supported me. And I, I was um, getting my attendings phone numbers for uh, so that I could reach out to them after after things kind of settled down, if I ever had any issues or kind of um, knowing that you know, there are people there that you can talk to. There are people there if you have the difficult times, the times where you don't kind of know what to do, the times where um, you're kind of questioning yourself. Um, I've definitely felt that support from my co-residents and from um, my attendings and the faculty at Utilito. Um, I also love my co-residents. We get along very well. We are a very diverse group of people. We all are like a, um, from different places. We're all different races. And we've all gotten along pretty well. And um, especially the intern class, you know, you end up being close to the class of people you come in with. And we do activities outside of work. Um, we actually had a game night a couple of nights ago, and it was like pretty fun. So I, I love being here. I love the support that I've gotten, and I love some of the connections I've been able to make in the few short months that I've been here. Thanks, Latoya. All right, I'm going to kick it off with some of the questions that um, we're getting. So one of them is um, if you got if what is your favorite part about living in Toledo? It's so affordable. I have a little. <laughs> Very expensive price. Yeah, I'll be honest. I'm I like um let me think about my word choice. I'm destroying anybody that I know in terms of the price that I'm paying. I'm in a house, a two bedroom house for seven twenty five, and it's me and my wife and we have a nice backyard. Um you won't find a better cost of living really in any place that you really want to be at. Yep, I'll also chime in. I live in like a condo style area right now and the proximity to the bike trail is giving me so much peace right now. I have no complaints whatsoever in the middle of 2020 and I know not many people can say that. Um, what I like is I come from Michigan and I've noticed over the years the stress of just getting anywhere and just living in Toledo and not having to worry about traffic, the proximity to Ann Arbor. I usually do a one month Every once a month, I do a wellness visit for myself to Ann Arbor because I like food. Um, and then I also love Detroit, so I like to mix it up with that as well because I went to Wayne State. Um, and probably once COVID ends, hopefully I can go to Chicago. But I mean, the proximity of those three cities alone just gives you an idea of how, or, and even Canada, because I'm also Canadian, I go to Canada. So the proximity of those three cities and the country itself, um, makes it very feasible to get around and do things, but also you can save that money and be able to do those things because of the cost of living there. So that's what I like. You know, that says a lot about you in 2020 with no complaints. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to talk about your favorite part of living in um, Toledo? I, I have a different perspective coming from a very, very different background. I mean, myself, um, I came from Africa and I have no family here and I'm a single mom. So um, I was really scared living in Toledo. I mean, I, living in the state all by myself and having to do residency with kids and all by myself, single mom with no family. But uh, Toledo, to be honest, made that very easy to me. I mean, everybody keeps asking me, how do you do it? Like they keep asking me, how do you go home and take care of the kids and manage to go outside and visit places? But I would say that our residency program was very, very supportive and they appreciated um, that I was very dedicated to both my my career and my family. And I felt very, very well supported. In addition to that, I felt like Toledo, despite it is a very small city, it had uh, like many family friendly places and many places I can take my kids to. I mean, and I mean, it's just an amazing place to live and to work. Thank you. Yeah. Honestly, I think also what needs to be said is the fact that like residency, if you're coming here for residency, the whole premise behind the word residency is that you're going to be a resident of the hospital. 
Um, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be very similar regardless of where you go. I think the most important thing is that you make sure that you're a fit for the hospital itself. Because that's going to be your home. That's going to be your community. Uh, the people that you interact with there, you're going to probably interact with more than your family, your friends. And I mean, uh, really anyone else that you're going to come into contact with in your life. And so um, it's nice that you have a Starbucks and it's nice that you can drive to Chicago. I've, I've gone to Chicago a couple of times since being here. Um, you know, we can we can tell you about all the nice things that exist in Toledo itself. But if you're not buying into the people here, I think you're going to do yourself a disservice. Yes, let me also touch upon what Devin just said. Um, what really highlighted um, the support that you have, not just in my personal like um, residency program, but the whole all of GME in general is since the onset of the pandemic, um, you see a lot of residents like either on different social media platforms, not really highlighting the support that they have being in the throes of COVID and, t and not having enough um, personal protective equipment, things like that. You hear stories of even residents who are dying because they don't have any other choice other than to treat these patients. And unfortunately, this is our reality, but honestly, the GME from the get-go, we had um, instituted practices and different like emergency protocols. At one point we had to initiate it, but I never had a doubt that the program, my internal medicine program had my back. If as an intern, we had tiers where third years were seeing patients before second years, interns rarely had to deal with COVID at all. And that stands to date, even though numbers are climbing right now. Um, so there are layers in place to, that show how supported you are because the focus here should be for you to get your education, should be for you to get your training, and it shouldn't be for you to be a workhorse. And I definitely can stand by that with um, the elites for internal medicine and probably for the other programs as well. Thanks, Joan. There's another question uh, in the chat. If you guys could change one thing about the program, what would it be and why? Ooh, I have a good thing. Uh, more free food. I had the uh, I had the meal card for one of our uh, uh, so for for our program we get these meal cards and they're they're useful when you're in your off service like in the MICU. And the amount of food and happiness I had that we tend not to get in emergency medicine. I guess I would change that one thing. But otherwise, for the most part, uh, not too much. I mean, we have a good class of eight people. Um, faculty in emergency medicine. Uh, they're all very kind. Uh, and then uh, when I when I interviewed here, I, I I was sold with how well the faculty were invested. I mean, uh, one of our the assistant program director, she stayed on her night shift to come interview us too. So if that doesn't show more about the commitment towards uh, the residents and the new class, I mean, I'm not sure what will. Thanks, Eric. Um, some of the things that I wanted to change, I feel like over the course of this last year, people have heard me be a little bit vocal slash maybe too vocal about uh one of the biggest challenges i think that me and my uh, fellow anesthesia residents had was our education days so sometimes you'll notice that programs do a really good job at communicating uh the needs of their residents to other off service um programs uh in our case I, I would hope that in the future, um, it does get improved. Uh, it, it was like, essentially, we have didactics and we'd almost um, run into problems with uh, low staffing or, um, you know, kind of misinformation. This was something that, you know, we kind of battled through through the year. Um, I think they've done a lot better job at communicating, you know, what each resident is expected to do. And um, I think that what you can kind of take from that is that they are, they are working for solutions for all the problems. Uh, they, right now, we just had this really long meeting 
about um, getting anesthesia residents over to Toledo Hospital um, because right now U UTMC is kind of where our anesthesia core group is. Um, I think that you know you won't you'll be hard pressed to find a problem that they aren't trying to solve right now. Thanks, David. Um, you want to get the next question, Shaz? Yeah. So uh, okay, our next question is. Are there any programs in place to support residents and a young family? Well, I was just going to say, I don't think I'm the right person to speak of this because I don't have a young family myself, but I do keep an eye on the emails that are sent. And I do know that there are um, programs that have been set up in terms of like helping with laundry services. And also, um, I don't know if this is still effective though. So you can um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Uthmani, but, um, I've seen emails in the past where there are laundry services, um, um, services for care for children, um, and this was mainly provided by medical students, and it was established by them and run by them as well. Um, so the, I can talk a little bit about that, but I haven't utilized anything, so maybe someone else on the panel has more information. Thank you, John. I mean, being a mom, I kind of speak up a little bit, <laughs> I think. So I have a seven-year-old and I have a five-month-old. And I um, mean, during my breastfeeding time, I was given the chance to uh, have an hour or two during my day to uh, to to pump and to breastfeed. Uh, I also felt very supportive in, um, I mean, in general, like you know, like in cases your kids were needing you for a school meeting, for sickness, God forbid, and. They were like understanding. In addition to that, the UT medical students were providing a child care during the COVID uh, timing, and they were regularly sending email uh, emails reminding us that they have this service and that we should use it. Uh, and that was like amazing. I mean, um, I, I worked in many places. I worked in Africa, Sudan, in the Middle East, in Qatar, and I felt the most supported here. I mean, family wise here was one of the best, to be honest. Thanks, there's another question. Um, how do the programs maintain the balance between supervision during internship and progressive autonomy as the interns uh, become more upper level? What, what has been your experience with that? I don't know how much um, internal, like internal medicine, I just did a, a whole year and I, I feel like that would be a harder one to speak on. So I'll leave that one for Joan. But um, for SICU, which I've gone through twice now, uh, you can see a remarkable difference between their level of comfort because you'll be working with the same attendings um, several times over. Um, you'll first when you come in. They, they might want to watch every procedure that you do. You might have the supervision of a chief resident or a, a senior um, around when you're doing lines or you're caring for more sick patients. Um, as you kind of continue throughout your month or months, you'll notice that, you know, maybe the attending is in the room, but maybe not right next to you. You'll notice that the the chief resident, you know, isn't eyeballing you at, ev through every step of the way or questioning, you know, what you would do next or what you would do if this happens. You'll notice that um, you'll kind of have this little bit of freedom that comes with every uh, progressive uh, line that you put in or procedure that you do uh, until you get to the point where, you know, maybe the attending is standing outside if they need you or, um, you know, maybe looking through the window or, or doing something else, but is available, uh, you know, at a moment's notice. And then I think that kind of speaks to, um, you know, your ability to grow and be autonomous uh, as you are progressing through your education. Being in emergency medicine, I think uh, that's one of the things I really like about this program is the fact that they do give a lot of trust even to interns, but like um, Devin said, uh, even in, as well as in emergency medicine, there's always an attending in a moment's notice. But since we do get uh, lots of procedures, uh, we start out with, you know, them making sure that you're 
they're there making sure you know the steps but if they know that you're comfortable and they feel comfortable they'll uh let you go as far as whatever you want to do or can do so i think uh it's great to from the get-go feel the trust of the attending and um so and but if you do need the help they're always right there on a moment's notice so you're not lost wait hoping that someone's there to save you because they are there uh which is a great feeling to know that they have that trust in you but you're never completely alone uh in the emergency room thank you jonathan um i'll speak to the aspects that are not as procedural based because um devin gave a really good example um it's pretty much the same for proce procedures and in internal medicine but in terms of um, the core um, electives, for example, when you're going through the wards, um, what you're expected to do in terms of orders, seeing patients and rounding, um, it can get pretty intense, but um, it's more of like a tiered approach. As an intern, your senior July, August carries a lot of the weight for you, might be putting a majority of the orders for you while you're trying to learn the system and the organization of the hospital and how to collaborate with um, other specialties. Um, and then kind of the leash is kind of just loosened a little bit as you become more comfortable with um, coordinating care between different subspecialties. For example, you'll be responsible for placing a majority of the orders as we get through the middle of the year, you'll be responsible for making a lot of the calls. So it's more of a team-based approach approach and then the seniors recognize the different weaknesses because not everyone comes at the same level and there's time set aside for you to work one on one with them and to um, enhance the skills that you need during that month with them and then sometimes you work with the same resident with the same residents and attending so that they can see your progression and they do um, you, you have mid service evaluations and also semi-annual evaluations so you can recognize your weaknesses and they can tell you what they think your weaknesses are and your strengths and what you need to work on on top of that. So there's always continuous um, monitoring of what you're doing and you can reevaluate over and over again a lot with the monthly evaluations of everyone so you know what's going on and what you need to enhance as well. All right, I'm gonna have this. Uh, the next question is, what words of advice would you give to a medical student applying right now? And what should they be looking for in a program? I would say uh, try to enjoy the fourth year. I know it's hard <laughs> with the whole pandemic going on, but it's really stressful. I know during this time, at least for me, I was like, oh, I only have one, two, three interviews or whatever it is. Oh my God, when are they gonna send more? but really try to enjoy uh, this time and uh, not, you know, take everything uh, with pleasure that you're gonna get into the field you, you're, you're wanting to, in terms of looking for a program, I think it's just asking questions and knowing what's important to you. Um, for some people, it is living in a big city and for others that's not a big deal it's more the people that are there uh with you for me the biggest thing was the people around so i wanted to i asked a lot of questions in terms of what do they do for fun uh how often do they get together and that's what was important to me so i think it's hard to uh it's determining what's important to your lifestyle for your happiness and making sure you ask those questions to those residents, uh, either in forums like this or in private matters. Uh, that way you get uh, the answers because uh, everybody is going to be different. But the most important thing is you being happy wherever you end up at. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think you guys are in a unique situation that makes it extremely difficult to to judge where it is that you want to be. Um, I think the most important thing is is face to face interactions, to be honest, because it's a little bit difficult for you to understand uh, what someone or something is about in a 10, 15 minute interaction, especially over something like this. Um, I think that if you have the opportunity to 
you know, ever get out to some of the programs, including us out here, um, you know, that you would want to go to. I think that interacting with, uh, you know, whoever you can possibly bump into would be a great idea. Um, see if you can reach out to some of the, the residents to see if, you know, maybe they just have a little bit of time to chat see if if uh if you can actually communicate with them on a a regular level so that you know you would know that there are some people that you have commonalities with that you know might be there to assist you in anything that isn't you know your exact specialty related to to residency that that would be my advice for you guys yeah, no, uh, you have to go to a residency program where they accept you as a person. I mean, you're, you're going to see a lot of places where these residents, you know, these seniors, third years, fourth years, even that uh, they don't really care about you. You know, you're, you're just not another number, another, you know, another figure for them to just go through. You know, if you go to a program where you can go to your director's um, office and mention kind of grievances or things you want to change, that's not a real program you want to go to in the first place or where the residents don't get along. Or you know they they feel more, um, kind of you know that they need to stay quiet or stay down. I mean, part of the reason why I picked this program is when I saw the seniors last year, they were all very open, and they were they were willing to say things that they really liked about the program, and even like the like quote bad things about the program too. But they they were honest about it too because they realized you know things are changing, and you know the program's trying to do its best to kind of move forward. And I think a program where people are honest with each other and are willing to change is one that you really want to go to. I just want to add one more thing. Get out of your comfort zone. Regardless of what program you want to choose, get out of your comfort zone. Work hard. Follow your passion. Wake up every day willing to change somebody's life, some patient's life. Um, do it with love. Don't just do it to do it. You know what I mean? Residency is a temporary space. It's just like two, three, four years maximum. And it's going to change your whole life. So do it with love and get out of your comfort zone. Thank you, Della. We are coming on to the end of the uh, time here. And I see we haven't got to all the questions, but we're not going anywhere. I mean, we're going somewhere tonight, but after tonight, we are here. Every, every person on the line, every resident on the line, all the leadership here, we're here uh, for you. You can reach out to us individually. And I really thank you for choosing yourself tonight and, and really considering us as a, as a possible destination for your training. I'm gonna pass the mic back to Dr. Frederick for closing remarks and, and thanks again. We couldn't ask for better residents and, and thank you for spending time this evening to share your experiences. Thank you all. We want to really again, thank you as Dr. Kuczynski said, I thank you uh, to my colleagues who have uh, walk through these various elements. We hope that all of the student audience has really uh, gotten a good picture of us in a short amount of time, uh, as far as our programs, the university, our uh, commitment to diversity, inclusion, and really creating a supportive environment in the College of Medicine. And I think our residents have shared stories that I really appreciated that kind of show that the actions have uh, lined up with what our plan and our goals are for creating that culture and supporting on the way through residency training. We thank you again. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we hope that if you have further questions, comments, or concerns, or want to reach out to individual programs or individual areas, uh, whether it's with Dr. Jenkins, Dr. Ivmani, myself, uh, in the GME uh, recruitment world, please don't hesitate to do that. Again, we thank you for participating with us and don't hesitate to reach out to us. And we look forward to meeting you in person someday. All right. Thank you all. Good night. Have a good night. Be safe. Thank you.